So to kind of illustrate in a smaller, smaller scale what we're talking about, um, I would love to introduce some of you to my family. I have a picture. There we go. So spoiler work, the eight o'clock service didn't get to see my, my family. So you guys are the special people. There we go, right? I'm just joking. Um, but this is my beautiful family. It's my wife, Janelle. There's our good-looking daughters. You can see where the good looks come from. It's from mom. Um, but that's Addison, and that's Brielle. I'm very blessed, way beyond my means and what I deserve with, with these beautiful people. However, however, Addison, you know, she's five, and, you know, she, let's just be honest, she's like me. She has a sweet tooth. How many of you have a sweet tooth, right? Right? And, and you parents, grandparents, people who have watched children, you know candy is a, like, a powerful weapon or a tool, to, right? Can be persuasive or if used improperly, you know, it's like got a caution label on it. If you give your child too much of this, bad things will happen type of a thing, you know? So we keep our candy in a specific drawer, or did, I should say, kept it in a specific drawer. And one night, we, we came to find out that one of our rules, which is you don't come and get candy, you ask parents for candy. We will decide how much or how little candy you're going to get. Um, we'll decide that. And we kind of come to find out waking up one morning to go to Addison's bed. And in a specific part of the kitchen where there's a counter, which I personally don't want her going on there because I, I prepare my food in the kitchen. I don't need your feet there. I don't know where else you've ran. I don't know. And then you did that, and then you went into the cabinet, and you got the candy, and you siphoned it off to your room, and you made a little pile in your bed. And what? Did I do that? Janelle, did I do that? Did they learn that from me? Because I think, they, I don't know where they learned that from. But I did, Addison did that. She had broken the rule first, mainly, of going to get candy and ha- without permission, eating it. Not just eating it, but, you know, making a stash for when the world ends or whatever it is. <laughs> And so there was a consequence, you know, and involved the trash can, a lot of candy going into the trash can because there is consequence when we disobey. And what we're going to see here in Ezra 9 is not necessarily the payments, but we see the lack of disobedience. And I want to give you a little bit of context before we read, but as we read, I also want to respect and honor God's word. And so if you're willing and able, um, I would like to actually just read Ezra chapter 9, verses 10 through 15, as we um, get to dive into what Ezra has to say to us this morning. So it says, but now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, the land you are entering to possess is a land that is polluted, a land polluted by the corruption of its people. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance." What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt, and yet our God has punished us less than our sins deserved and has given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us for leaving us no, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, God of Israel, You are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, no one, not one of us can stand in your presence. Thank you, you may be seated. I wanna give you, like I said, context here. Two things. First, I would like you, if you have your Bibles, flip to Deuteronomy chapter seven. It's the fifth book of the Bible in the Old Testament, and it's got, it contains a number of God's laws for his people to live by. And specifically in chapter seven, God points out something that's very important to Ezra 9 here, okay? It's very, very important. So I'm gonna read it for you, uh, the first six verses of Deuteronomy 7, just to give you that context. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you're entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, 
the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when, you're, when the Lord, your God, has delivered them over to you, you have, and you have defeated them, then you must, totally, uh, must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Keep that in mind. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from, from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. You see that? Keep that in mind. God's calling his people holy. You are a holy people, okay? You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people to be his treasured possession. Now, this is the context of before Joshua lead God's people into the promised land, but God's given them in Israel, God's people specific instructions here to, to rid themselves of everything that they enter, destroy it, and don't intermarry. This is not a, a call for Christians today, by the way. We're talking a specific command that God's people right then and there to not intermarry. It's not a call of interracial or interethnic marriages, uh, marriage to be not done. No, 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 it's specific to these people groups. So I wanna make that clear because it's very important when we flip over to Ezra chapter nine. See, Ezra nine, to give you context if you need some catching up, Ezra six, seven, and eight is the return from exile to Jerusalem to build the temple, by the way, on Persia's dime. The government has paid, think about that for a second. The government is paying to rebuild the temple. That's an amazing thing that God has handed to his people. Some would call that a second chance when you look at the history of Israel. And what we're gonna find out in Ezra 9 is how seriously they took God's grace and mercy. See, in verse one, we, Ezra, by the way, to remind you, has also been there for a while. It's not just that he shows up on the scene. This is happening in the, in the, behind the back of Ezra. He's unaware of what's going on. And some brave people come forward and they say, uh, in verse one of chapter nine, after these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, take note of that, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with the detestable practice, their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Parasites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and have mingled with the holy race, uh, mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and the officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. Do you see what has happened here? It is not just a couple of people of God's people that have gone rogue. It is the priests, the Levites, who are not just encouraging, but actively participating in a practice right after they've completed the temple, in the process of this. And Ezra hears this news. And I want you to take note of his response. Verse three tells us, this is what Ezra does. This is what he writes down. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak. I pulled my hair from my head. I pulled hair from my head and beard and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God, of the God of Israel, gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness, circle that word unfaithfulness, the second time we've seen it, unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. He couldn't believe it. Do you see what God has done? We have been in exile for years. We've finally gotten home. We've rebuilt the temple and we didn't have to pay for it. And what is going on here? And the seriousness of sin has reared his ugly head. Because Ezra recognizes it. On your note sheet, I have three things that Israel forgot when they returned to Israel. Here's the first one. They forgot the seriousness of sin, how serious sin is. It is serious because it separates us from God. It breaks a relationship. That word unfaithfulness in the Hebrew roots back to a term of disloyalty, infidelity. It is a great, 
great practice of sin that is happening. And what's worse is like we've already known that the priests and Levites who should have known better to correct it are the ones engaging in and participating in it as well. And Ezra recognizes this. He recognizes this and he tears his tunic and clothes, but more so he pulls his hair and a beard. I don't know about you. I've never done that. It sounds extremely painful. <laughs> to pull your hair at the sight of sin because you have seen what you have been called chosen, break a covenant that you have made to God to follow him. After receiving what you have received, Ezra is completely distraught and appalled. And he goes further in verses six, five through seven, excuse me. <clears throat> and he says, then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God. And I prayed, I am ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins, circle that word our, we're gonna touch back on that in a little bit. Our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. Excuse me, let me restate that. Because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword of in captivity, to pillage and humiliation of foreign kings as it is today. We were just in exile because of our sin. And I want you to know when Ezra says this, it's not, look what they did. This is all of us. The backwash of sin is a real thing and it affects everyone on the boats. It affects everyone on the beach. It affects everyone in your life. And Ezra is not saying he's guilty, he's sinless by any means. He's saying it's our sin. In fact, this is an intercessory prayer. Daniel 9, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, all three of these passages, we'll see intercessory prayers. Specific this one, that word our, if you go from verse six all the way to the rest of this chapter, 21 times, you will see it used. You will see the word us used seven, uh, 13 times and the word we used seven times. That's important. Ezra is not removing himself in any way from the sin that he didn't commit. Rather, he's the one with people around him going on behalf of these people to say, God, this is wrong. We have messed up. And sometimes we fall into the trap that because we didn't commit a serious sin or as bad as somebody else, we fall in the trap of weighing sin by an earthly measure. What do I mean by that? It's like we take a scale and I, I, I only, you know, I took a couple of bucks and or I took a couple of candy bars or something small, really minuscule saw, hey, but you stole. That's sin. But it's not as bad as murdering somebody. On the earthly perspective, yeah, we can use our earthly counters and they're, <laughs> you can weigh it. God's economy says all have sinned and fallen short. It didn't say what sin you committed. There's <laughs> no scale to put my sin on. It says, no, no, one sin breaks us in away from God. And that is a big deal. I promise it'll be good news because that sounds really heavy. What you're saying my small sin makes a difference? Yeah, I am. For me too. It's not like I stand over here perfect and holy. I ain't. Because it's only because of Jesus. We just sang in Christ alone that we get to find righteousness and holiness. Because sin is a big deal. And we need to stop looking in the binoculars at other people and trying to make ourselves feel better, but look in the mirror and say, man, Lord, I've been punished way less than I deserve, as Ezra will continue to say later on. Realizing that my, just because somebody else has sinned, I, there is an effect on that on the on the people of God. Sin is a big deal. See, and it ties into the rest of this, this prayer that Ezra will lead us in. Because he continues in verse eight. But now, for a brief moment, just a brief moment here, the Lord our God, there's that word again, has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins as he has given us a wall of protection in Judah 
in Jerusalem. Do you see what Ezra is recognizing here? In spite of the great sin that brought them into exile, we have read in these stories of chapter six, seven, and eight, which leads to here, that Ezra is recognizing the amazing grace and mercy of God. Cornerstone, no, do not lose sight of the amazingness and the depth and the richness and the beauty of the grace of God. Something that we don't deserve. The mercy of God. Not getting what we do deserve. And yet Jesus took the payment for us on the cross. And we see God's people here in a second chance, so to speak. Say, the sin that we're doing is not that big of a deal. And God, I know you brought us out of exile, but you'll be okay with what we're doing. Ezra recognizes the grace and mercy of God. He recognizes all the blessings that they have been given from financial cost of the temple to safety and protection that's been brought along. And yet it's been, it's been diluted because they didn't take their sin seriously. How do we view God's grace? It's a big question we must ask ourselves when we read this prayer. How do we view the grace and mercy that God has freely given us? It's a big question. It has major ramifications. See, grace is not given to us so we can sin and keep on sinning. This is why Ezra is grieving. Grace was given here so that God's people can rebuild the temple and and rebuild his city and to be made whole again, not to go and be free and do what they want. This is a big deal. This is a really, really big deal, specifically when when it comes to understanding and living into the holiness of God. So the rest of this section, Ezra will recognize one thing I want you to write down, another thing, excuse me, and that is how holy God is and their calling to be the same. We've read in Deuteronomy, part of the reason why I wanted to give you that context was I wanted you to see that God gave this command, but I also wanted you to see the why. It was to make them holy. They were chosen. God could have chosen anybody else and Deuteronomy says that, but he chose them and he wants them to be holy. See, verses 10 through 15, I'm gonna read it again just to refresh our minds of what Ezra was saying. But now our God, what? Can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through your servants and the prophets when you said the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples, by their detestable practices. They have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. So therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. And so what has happened to us as a result of our evil, there's that word again, our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we break your commands again and intermarry with, your, with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. So we are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though, you, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. Verse 15 is a chilling verse that because of our sin, we can't stand in the presence of God. See, we have this, we are so unworthy to be in the presence of God, yet we are so worthy because of Jesus. We have this balancing act of realizing we are called into holiness. And there is good news, I promise, about living in this holiness, but I would like to illustrate it this way. I have two bottles here full of water, this one right here, and this represents the purity of God the holiness of God, the the cleanliness of God, that there is, this thing's untainted, literally. I've not opened it at all when I got it. It's literally not open. You will break the seal and taint it if you open it, so don't. Also, don't open this one. 
Yeah, it's not tea. I had someone like want to drink this after the last service, and I had to tell them, no, no, no. You, do, if you won't want to know what I put in there. You don't want to know. Absolutely not. But this is an example of what sin does to our life. There, we clearly would want this. If I were to offer you both of these and you wanted water, water, right here, you would take this one. Why? It's clean. It's pure. I know what it is. But sin dilutes our life. Now, the good news is about Jesus, he's the one that makes us holy. He pays for our sin. And eternally, when we get to heaven, amen. Jesus is the one that has paid for our sin. Here's the problem. I still got like 60 years to live on this planet or 40 years, whatever. God's given me time to live here, to live of a purpose, to glorify him, to point people towards him, to, be, to follow him. And I got these fleshly desires to get in the way. I got things that want to dilute my water and break it down. I know Jesus is maybe whole, but I got, I got things that are gunk and dirt and things that want to come and make the water dirty. I, I have maybe spiritual blind spots. I don't even know if something I'm doing wrong. <laughs> I need help there. I have, known blind, I have known sin in my life that I haven't dealt with. I have decisions where I need to make it. I don't know what to do, but this is what I want to do. Or, you know, I know God says this, but I really don't care. You know, I know God says to be a, a man or a woman of integrity and character, but, you know, if I fudge the numbers on this document, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's only affecting me. So it's not that big of a deal if I go ahead and do that. Or if I, you know, if I go ahead and go to that website, click on that link, and, you know, it's okay. I can dilute the water a little bit more. But could, God's given us grace and grace for all. And what we have done is we, we end up living a life that's not called into holiness because we have let ourselves discount the seriousness of sin and the greatness of the grace and mercy of God. And we lived in diluted water. God's calling us to live in this way. And the question we must ask is, how do we, how do we stay in this? How do we live in this? And I have a little bit of a guide for you. It's not an end-all, be-all. This is not a roadmap that if you do these four things, it's all good. Um, but it, I, this is why Ezra's so upset. If, if God wasn't holy, if God didn't call his people to be holy, if sin wasn't a big deal, then what the priests and Levites in Israel did in the beginning of Ezra 9, it's not a big deal. But because God is so holy and he calls us to be holy, this becomes a big deal. And so what does it mean for us to live holy? Because scripture is clear that you and I, this is not just an Old Testament command. This is a call for all Christians that we're called to be holy. First Peter 2, 9 speaks to us being holy. First Peter, uh, First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 speak to us being holy as God has called us to be holy. As I, God is holy, I call you to be holy is what it says. So I have four things I wanna remind you of. The first is this, that the definition of holy is to be set apart. Because what we're talking about is God is holy and is different, it is set apart. So when Israel were to re-inhabit the land, the people clearly that were there that didn't follow God around them were supposed to be able to look at Israel and say, you live different. I want to know why you're different. It should be an ultimate declaration of who God is. And that's what we're called to be, set apart. We're called to be holy. This transition from here to here is what we call the sanctifying work of Jesus, the sanctifying work of God, where God is making us new and not just paying for our previous sin, but since I am of the flesh, I probably will sin again, probably today, probably next week, probably three weeks from now. And God has gone before us in his sanctifying work to do that in us. But the reality is we need to remember that knowing that we're called to be set apart sets us up for pursuing God. And I want to dive into that in a little bit. But I want you to understand that God set Ezra out to call to and his people. He called them to live a life that would distinguish them so people would see the holiness of God. Cornerstone, this is what you are called to be. You're called to be clear and pure. And there is good news coming. I have for you in the end because we don't have to do it on our own but we need to be able to respond to the one who's calling us to be pure and holy. So here's the thing. Holiness grows as we choose surrender. I know in your fill in the blanks in your note sheets that says grows in, to strike the end. You know, I made a typo. See, I'm guilty. I, I'm not perfect. There you go. I put it right there in print for you, right there. But God grows us in his holiness as we choose to surrender. One of the things that Jesus in Luke chapter nine tells his disciples is if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. Take it up and follow me. And anyone who wants to save their life, they will lose it. 
So think about that. If we wanna gain life, life to the fullest, life to the fullest abundance, then we need to lose our life. What does that mean? It means it's no longer Ben's life to live. It's God's life to live in it through me. All right, God, you want me to do this at work? Okay, I, I prayed about it. I've seen it clear in your scripture. I'm following through with it because it's not my job. It's not about my comfort. It's not about my pleasure. It's not about my, my finances. It's not about, it's about what does, how am I following what your word says? How am I doing what you are calling me to do? It's no longer our life to live. It is God's life to live in and through me. So there is a surrender of my desires of what I want to God, but there's also a surrender of sin. Ezra is crying out in Ezra 9 about the sin of Israel. And it's a complete cry of repentance that God, you have given us such great of mercy. You've already given us, and you could see the repentant heart in Ezra. So to, to repent means not to just Stop sinning. It means to run towards God. You need to go away from what's wrong to do what is right. Go away from what is evil to go straight towards the Lord. And if we don't surrender our lives, then holiness will never grow. You could try, you could try, but your water will still look like this nonstop. Why? Because there's no surrender. You're trying to control something that God's supposed to be in control of. And some of you this morning need to let go of some things, need to maybe cut off some things, maybe need to put boundaries in your life because your water continues to look like this when God has called you to do this. So holiness can grow when we choose to surrender. Here's the third thing. Holiness is to be continually pursued. Ezra 9 is a lesson that that holiness is, that pause button was hit. The, the act of disobedience was the act of not pursuing holiness. And Ezra is in grieving about that. He's mourning. He's mourning the lack of obedience that Israel has shown. And I I'm worried and troubled because I think sometimes we follow in the, we fall into the trap that if I'm obedient to the God 98% of the time, that's good enough. Or 99% of the time, well, that's good enough. Yes, there is grace, but we can't expect God to be walking in us if we choose to walk in disobedience to God. God does not want to, God's not walking with us when we walk in active disobedience and active sin against him. And sometimes we fall into the trap like that is okay. Just like Ezra's uh, pointing out here. Ezra 9 points out that, that they, they thought everything was fine to dandy. They were there for a number of months while Ezra's with them. But there's a trap that is seen there. See, we need to be continually pursuing God. It is not like a light switch. I wish when we became in the Christians and we, we can just flip like a light switch, on, off, off. It's dark, I don't see, on, it's light, I do see. I wish it was that simple, but our lives here are a complete daily pursuit of Jesus. This is why it's so important when we push small groups and announce small groups and let that known to you, why, why we love that you come to worship in person with us, why we, why we want you to be involved with others, why we give you devotions, why we say, hey, we should read this verse, why we encourage times of prayer, why we have a house of prayer. Why is that important? It's not the act it is, it's the, what it connects us to. It's who it connects us to because everything should be pointing back to God. And when we try to do life on our own and do it on our own terms and we haven't surrendered, it's hard for us to continually pursue. And I wanna challenge us this morning that if we want God to be with us, we need to be obedient to him. We don't need to follow the example of Ezra or God's people in Ezra 9, which is I get back to where God's led me and I can go back to my old life as is because I've been returned home. No, no, don't water down God's grace like that. It's been too, it was bought with the price of Jesus' blood. It's too precious for us to dilute. Finally, holiness is to be pursued in community. You and I are called into community with one another. There's an accountability that's there. There's a, there's a sense of encouraging one another. Notice in verses three and four of Ezra, it's not just Ezra by himself. There are some people there that still honor and want to worship God no matter what, and they tremble. They come, it says in verse four, everyone who trembled at the words of God 
of Israel gathered around me because of the unfaithfulness. They gathered around them. They know what's going on and they gathered around. Why? Because we, this is something we pursue together. I can't, it doesn't say this in here, but I wonder what Ezra must have felt. At least, is there some hope that there's others around me as he is mourning, as he's pulling his hair, as he's ripping his clothes? I wonder what he is feeling there. And there are times where I've had others in my life encourage me, challenge me, call me out. And it was so, so good. Why? Because it pushed me towards this. It pushed me towards holiness. It pushed me towards what God's calling me to be, not where I was at or where I wanted to be even. We need people in our lives to encourage us, to challenge us, to pray for us, to walk with us in our life. And I'm gonna encourage you, if, if you don't have a small group, if that's something you don't have a connection to, I'm gonna encourage you to pursue that today, this week. Because God is not meant to be, have us be isolated in our relationship with Jesus. We don't have a private relationship. We have a public relationship with Jesus. And that is why this is, again, so uh, such a big sin. It's not just a separation of God, but it's a separation of the witness of who God is. So holiness needs community. There is good news. I've told you there's good news. I wanna share with you the good news. So we finish up this morning. I wanna remind us that we are made holy because of whose we are not who we are. I'll say that one more time. We're made holy because of whose we are, not who we are. And if I had to be the standard for holiness, man, I will fall short severely. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God that we have a way to be holy. Why? Because now I'm not living my own life I'm actually been reborn and adopted into the king. I am a child of God because of whose I belong to. See, Jesus came, he bought us with a price so he can make you clean and make you pure. This is why there's no sinners in heaven. <laughs> if God so, is so holy, he can't have any bit of sin. So he has to purify us. That's why Jesus had to come. There is no sin in heaven, but there is their saints, which is what he makes you and me. He cleans us, he purifies us, and he's there for us. I wanna encourage you this morning. 1 John 1, 9 says this. This is such good news. You're gonna love this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to live this way anymore. No one in this room, no one watching at home has to live in this way anymore. God is faithful to give, as long as we're repentant. It says if we confess our sins, that's not just saying verbally, but it's a heartfelt confession. When we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive and he's faithful to purify, which means cleanse you, which means you don't have to do it. It's because of whose you become. It's because of whose you are. And I wanna ask you this morning, do you know whose you are? Do you know whose you are? Is Christian just something I write down as an identity label for? So like something I am, I are, sorry, something or is this actually Jesus is in all parts of my life because I am his. I wanna invite you into that. There may be some of you that I'm not gonna make an assumption that every single person here follows Jesus because you're at church. And maybe for the first time, you, you maybe feel this call to, I want to be part of the family. I want to know whose I am because I've seen now who's I belong to. Maybe some of you are in this battle like Israel is where we're, we're, we've had sin, we're living in sin. I need to turn, I need to run the other way. I wanna invite you this morning. You have that chance to make that decision. You do not need to wait. You can make that decision this morning to say, God, I'm done living in diluted waters. I wanna live in the clean, refreshing waters of you and your grace. So I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna enjoy, I'm gonna invite you to pray with me. And if you pray one of those, if you pray a prayer of confession of repentance, if this is something you want to, want to pursue forward, if you want to have a relationship with Jesus and you make that decision, there are pastors around here after the service. We would love to talk with you. You can write in on your comment card. Send, we would love to connect with you later on. We'd love to connect with you today.
Because in the family of God, it's all about whose we are, not who we are. Lord, I thank you so much, so much for the grace that's only found in Jesus. I do not deserve it, one bit. None of us do. The seriousness of sin is a real thing because it has torn us apart from you. It's completely kept us out of relationship with you. But because of your grace and mercy, so generous and kind, and out of your love, you sent your son. So we didn't have to be eternally separated from you, but we could be eternally living with you. And we can do that today. And Lord, if there are some out there that want to turn over to you, whether it be the first time or come back to you, I ask that you would stir their hearts. And if you wanna pray this prayer with me, pray with me. Lord, I recognize the seriousness of my sin. And I'm sorry for what I have done. But I know you are faithful and good and just and ready to, to make me new. And I wanna be made new. I believe in who your son is that he is the one true God who came to live a perfect life on this world and this earth, to die for me, to rise for me, and to live in and through me. And I want to commit my life to not just following him today, but for the rest of my life, for the rest of my days. Lord, I want to make that commitment to you, to follow you and everything I do because of who you are and because of who I belong to. We love you, Lord, so much. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen.